In this video, we'll go through a couple of properties of line integrals that are often useful in simplifying calculations, and then present uh, an example where we calculate line integrals for uh, different paths. So suppose you're trying to calculate a line integral going from point A to point B along this curve. If you go from point A to point B, this is the same thing as calculating the negative of that line integral going from point B to point A, so traveling backwards along the path. If there is a point C somewhere between A and B, we can also calculate the line integral going from A to B in terms of a line integral going from A to C. And then completely independently, we can calculate the line integral going from C to B. And this is useful when you have a complicated shape or, or a mixture of different curves going from point A to point B. You break up your integral amongst the different curves. Now, you should know that line integrals occur in different forms than this one. You can also have a line integral of a scalar function phi along a certain path. And you can also have, although this is a bit more rare, you see it in uh, problems in magnetism, but you can have a line integral as the cross product of some vector function crossed with your uh, with your path element. And of course, the usual form for calculating work. And in general, the way that you solve line integrals is you want to reduce them to a set of scalar integrals. So integrals like the kind that you're used to from calculus, from first year calculus. So for example, for this one, you can imagine breaking it up along its components. And you calculate each one along the given path. All right, and here we've taken this to be in Cartesian coordinates. So whenever you have a straight path, you don't need the parametric representation of curves, you can just do it in terms of dx, dy, and dz. Another way of thinking about doing the line integral for calculating work is to calculate separate scalar integrals for each one of the components of your force along a Cartesian direction, for example. So here, our force, I components fx in the i hat direction, fy in the j hat direction, and fz in the k hat direction, and the r remained like this. 
more generally, you can think of this dot product. Like this, so the x component of your force can depend on x, y, and z. The y component can also depend on x, y, and z, and so on for the z component. And you should think of dx as how much x varies. along the path that you're calculating it for. And similarly for dy and dz along their corresponding directions. All right, so we'll see an example applying this idea to a few paths. So as an example, we're going to calculate the work done by this force going from the origin to point P at X is equal to one and Y is equal to one along three different paths, gamma one, gamma two, and gamma three. The first path goes from the origin to point Q over here, right underneath. So this is point one zero, and then it shoots straight up to point P along another straight line. The second path, gamma two, goes from zero to P along the path over here, given by the line y is equal to x. And finally, gamma three goes from zero to p along a quarter circle that is centered at point q. So to calculate the work, we need to perform the line integral. And we're going to break it up into two paths. We're first going to calculate the line integral going from the origin to point Q. So we'll just loosely denote it like this. And then from point Q to point P. And remember from the properties that this is equivalent to calculating the line integral from zero to P along this path directly. So from zero to Q, in general, we said that dx, when it was a straight line, could be described by dx i hat plus dy j hat. Going from zero to Q, Y doesn't vary. So dy is equal to zero. And X varies from zero to one. So if we call this integral I, and this one integral two I, And this one is zero to one. And so this means dr is just dx i hat. When you take the dot product of uh, this force with this dr, you're only left with the i hat component. So remember, properties of the dot product of unit vectors. If you take the dot product of a vector with another one as perpendicular, you get zero. And if you take it with itself, it gives you the norm, which for a unit vector is equal to one. So this is the line integral of the X component of the force. X is varying along this path, Y is equal to zero. So we can set that to zero and only dx varies. 
So the x component of our force was y, but along this path, y was equal to zero. So this first line integral gives us zero. The second integral going from q to p So if we look at dr now, along this path, x is not varying and y varies from zero to one. So dx is equal to zero because there's no variation of x along this path. So that means that we're left with a dr that's equal to dy j hat. When we take the dot product of our force with this dr, we're only left with the j hat component. Q to P, F of y. Now x is equal to one and y is varying, dy. We can write down our limits of integration. So y varies from zero to one. So this gives us zero to one times dy, which is equal to two. And because we have broken it up into two paths, this one gave us zero, this one gave us two then the line integral or the work done along path one is equal to two joules if you want to put units on it. Our next line integral was uh, going from the origin to point one one along a curve gamma two and just to refresh your memory, gamma two was along the curve y is equal to x. And this was the form of our force. So we still don't need to resort to the parametric representation of curves because for this particular path, however much y varies by, x has to vary by that same amount because y is always equal to x. And so x and y must change by the same amount along this path. So that means that dr retains all of the terms. So some variation in X along the I hat direction and some variation in Y along the J hat direction. So when you take the dot product of our force with the displacement vector, you get And just do it explicitly. So when you take the dark product of this term with this term, you're just left with this scalar. The i hats are the i hat dotted with i hat is equal to one i hat dotted with j hat is equal to zero, so this doesn't give you anything. j hat dotted with i also gives you zero, so you still don't get anything. And then this j hat dotted with j hat gives you two x dy. Now, along this curve, y has to equal to x. So 
we can either replace every y by an x or every x by a y, and the variation has to remain the same. So we replace whichever variable we kept by the other one. So what I mean by that is, for example, we can replace y by x. We have dx, we retain this dx. And because we're changing y, we also need to change dy into dx. So we have another dx over here. And regardless of the one we keep, we keep because they both vary from zero to one, our limits of integration are zero to one. So this is simplified. We can factor out a dx. Add these two and perform our integration, which gives us 1.5 joules for the amount of work done along this path. And for comparison, remember that along path one, we had calculated that the work was two joules. So you can already see a difference in the amount of work done depending on which path you're taking. Finally, along the third path, which goes uh, on a quarter circle centered at point Q. I'm gonna calculate the line integral along this curve. And although we don't have to, it's easiest if we parameterize this curve so that x is described in terms of some variable u and y is described in terms of that same variable u. And typically for circles, we take u to be the angle. And for this particular one, because it's centered at the point one zero, the parametric representation with respect to theta. So we're changing u by theta just to make it clear that it's the angle in our circle. It can be described by the following parametric equation. So x is described by one minus cosine of theta and y is described by sine of theta. Instead of using the formula presented earlier, we're going to uh, take a bit of a shortcut. So we need a way of expressing dr in terms of our new variable theta. We're gonna play the same trick we did before. We're going to, or similar trick. We're going to divide by d theta and multiply by d theta. So that it's made, it hasn't made any difference. But what we're trying to do now is take the derivative of this parametric representation with respect to theta. And this will give us sine of theta i hat plus cosine of theta j hat times d theta. Now, we need to find our limits of integration. And for this, I encourage you to stop the video and try to think about what you think the limits of integration would be for theta. So theta is the angle between this curve and any point along the circle. So it's zero over here and it gradually increases like that.
All right, so that means that theta varies from zero being over here all the way to being straight up, which is pi over two. So that means our integral becomes zero to pi over two. The x component of our force from the dot product times the uh, i hat component of our displacement vector sine theta plus the y component of our force times the j component over here of our displacement vector. times d theta. Now, because we have a parametric representation for the curve and our force over here, we need to replace y and x by their corresponding parametric representation on this curve. So on this curve, we have that y is equal to sine of theta and x is equal to one minus cosine theta. So at any point in our force where there's a y, we need to replace it by sine of theta because that's the variable we're integrating with respect to. And anywhere you see an x, you need to replace it by one minus cosine of theta. So that means that f of x now becomes sine of theta and f of y now becomes two times one minus cosine of theta. So we're left with the following integral from zero to pi over two of sine squared plus this cosine theta, and I encourage you to fill in the details for yourself to make sure that you understand what's going on. And this is equal to mi two minus pi over four, which is about 1.21 joules. So you can see once again, we found a different value for the work along this curve.